Hey everybody. Um, Morning. 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 Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about my story and what I'm doing now. Um, and uh, the sort of theme of it is this uh, perspective that I've come to around something I call inclusive capitalism. Um, so just to give you a sense of sort of where we're headed towards. Um, so I actually grew up in Los Angeles in Glendale. Um, and from a very early age, my overriding goal in life was to be rich and successful. And, you know, a lot of that came from my dad, um, who was this sort of Willie Loman type guy, a sort of out of work salesman that had these huge dreams and, you know, was always talking about uh, the moment when he would sell a company or sell a screenplay and make a million dollars. And, you know, our family was always sort of living on the edge. So there was, you know, rented houses, junky cars, um, paycheck to paycheck. You know, it was not uncommon to have the cable or the electricity turned off. And my dad was always talking about this future moment when things would be okay. Um, and, you know, the only thing as sort of big as my dad's ambition uh, was his temper. And, you know, I grew up in a pretty rough household and I, you know, I can still remember sort of what his face would look like when he'd, he'd lose it. And, you know, so from a, a pretty early age, I sort of had, to, had this experience as a kid of being sort of like insecure and fearful and anxious and you know, really began nurturing this fantasy about what it would mean to be rich and how that would solve all those problems. Um, so I went to college in New York and then I got a job on Wall Street. And Wall Street was, um, it, you know, it was this world that I felt like I had, could only imagine before seeing it. I mean, I remember the first time I walked onto a trading floor and, you know, it was a, it was a, room the size of a football field with glass-walled offices around the perimeter and row after row after row of trading desks and you know each trader sat in front of six uh, computer screens and you know had a phone turret in front of them that you know looked like the cockpit of an airplane basically and you know it looked like they were playing you know, a video game for their job and that looked super cool to me but what looked even better was you know, the clothes that they were wearing and uh, the, how their hair was cut. And, you know, traders, they carry these uh, money clips uh, in their front pockets that have just wads of hundreds in them. And it's just part of the culture. And it's, I think it probably happened because eventually they were carrying too much money to actually fit in a wallet. But, you know, <laughs> they were just pull them out. And, you know, here you get lunch and pull off two, you know, whatever, hundreds. And, um, you know, to me... You know, as soon as I saw that trading floor, I was like, this is what I want to be, and this is what I want to do. Um, and so I got an internship, I got a full-time job at Bank of America, and I started climbing the ranks, and you know, by my sort of mid-20s, I was living this, you know, spectacular life. I had a, you know, big loft apartment down on Bond Street in New York, and I was taking Caribbean vacations, and this was back before Uber, but I, I would have a, you know, the, the black car number of my broker. So whenever I'd fly into town, there would be a black car waiting for me back when that was actually meaningful. Um, <laughs> and, you know, there was a lot of things that I, I loved about Wall Street. I loved the, you know, intensity and the camaraderie and the, you know, the analysis and the trading. It was, it was, it was an incredibly exciting job. Um, and yet I started to notice things, you know, I remember one day I was at a um, club in Las Vegas. We had gone on this sort of trader boondoggle that was paid for by brokers. So it was like a helicopter to the airport and then a first class flight and then $5,000 tickets to the De La Hoya Mayweather fight and dinner at Nobu and then this fabulous club and it was, you know, thousand dollar bottles of champagne and beautiful women and I had this experience where I was you know looking around me and I had this moment that I was like you know my life looks like I fantasized it would since I was a little kid and I still feel sort of the same way that I've always felt I felt 
I felt empty. And I, I sort of chuckled to say that because if you've ever read a Wall Street memoir, this is not an uncommon occurrence. This is sort of the cliche, I feel empty moment. Um, <laughs> and it, it was true, and, but for me that was sort of the beginning of, uh, I guess, a search um, to sort of understand that a little bit, that emptiness. And, you know, part of my story is, does have to do with my dad and it has to do with being a troubled kid. And I was, um, during, during my time on Wall Street, I had started seeing a counselor and was doing sort of a lot of work internally to, you know, process some of the stuff that had happened to me as a kid and deal with my feelings around my dad. Um, and, you know, that was going on, and that was going on for basically the six or seven years before the crash of 08. And the crash of 08 for me was, I was actually at this point the senior trader for one of the largest hedge funds in the world, and um, we were actually making money during the crisis. So it was, you know, it, was, it, it wasn't that I was worried about my job, but I started to have a sense about the, the sort of industry that I was a part of, and some of what happened was, you know, I remember one day I was in the, in an office with my billionaire boss and several other traders, and we were talking about the hedge fund regulations being proposed by Congress, and everybody in the room thought they were a terrible idea, and I was starting to think differently, and so I said, you know, well, isn't it better for the system as a whole? And my, like, the room went silent. <laughs> 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 and my boss, who was this, you know, rocket scientist smart guy, um, you know, shot me this scathing look and said, look, Sam, I don't have the brain capacity to think about the system as a whole. I can only think about, I can only think about what's good for us and our business. Um, and it wasn't so much that I judged him as that I sort of saw myself in him and understood, I think, in that moment that the, that was sort of my definition of success too. It was pulling all this money and power to me and accruing to me. And, you know, for one, it didn't look that good on him. Um, but also it made me sort of start to understand, I think, what that feeling of emptiness was. And, you know, that was sort of this, this moment for me when I, I began to understand that something was missing in my life. Um, Later that year, actually, um, I, I got my last bonus, which was $3.6 million. And um, it was this, that, that was more money than I'd ever made. Um, and I, it was actually this sort of like, it, it was a really fraught moment for me because I got this big bonus, but I was also thinking about leaving. So in this like single instant, I got more money than I you know, ever thought was possible. But I also knew that if I left, then I would have to leave half of it on the table. And I was also pissed at my bosses because it wasn't bigger, because I had, <laughs> I had been really profitable that year. Um, and, I, and I was sort of bummed out about that. And there, there was a, you know, in that moment, I think, was a lot for me. It was like, you know, it encapsulated both the, you know, fruitions of all my ambition, it, it encapsulated you know, exactly what I was coming to understand was the problem, which was that for me that wasn't enough money and it was crazy to have a 30 year old, you know, English major sort of making that kind of money. Um, and it also sort of made me understand that it was never gonna be enough if that wasn't enough. Um, and so I left Wall Street uh, a couple months later and, uh, you know, it, it was a very, very difficult decision for me. And after I left Wall Street, I, you know, I, I was so ready to sort of get out of that culture of ambition and achievement, and so I moved to a city that has absolutely no focus on ambition, Los Angeles. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I basically didn't know what I was going to do. Um, for a long time I started writing, um, I started sort of going to the beach and relaxing, and then I picked up this book um, called Tattoos on the Heart by a guy named Father Greg Boyle, who uh, is the founder of Homeboy Industries. And Homeboy Industries is one of the major sort of nonprofit institutions in this city, and it's a program that helps gang members um, become productive parts of society. Seven minutes, okay. Um, <laughs> And you know, Father Boyle, if you haven't read this book, it's spectacular and it's hilarious and it's touching. Um, 
But what I began to understand was that he was, um, his, his life was about the equal value of every life. And, you know, where my life had been about sort of clawing my way to the top, his life was about reaching down below him and lifting up the people that needed the most help. And you know, I remember crying as I read that book because I understood that that was something closer to what I wanted to do than you know, become a billionaire hedge fund guy. Um, so a couple, a couple years later, I started um, watching these sort of food documentaries. Do you remember when those things were big, like the Food Inc. and the Forks yeah. Over Knives, and I was like really into that. And then, uh, and then I watched this, this one called A Place at the Table, which was a food documentary, but it was about hunger in America, how in the richest country in the world, over 50 million people are on food stamps, and many of them are children. And while that broke my heart, what sort of absolutely blew my mind was this argument the film made about the confluence of hunger and obesity. And they basically said that there's these things called food deserts where there's, in low-income areas, where there's very little fresh food for sale and tons and tons of fast food. And so the hungriest people, the most food insecure people, were also the unhealthiest and had the highest rates of diabetes and you know, limbs getting amputated. And, and for me, this hit me on a super deep level because my whole family had struggled with food issues. Um, my dad has diabetes, my mom got the lap band surgery. I've got a younger brother, Daniel, who got to be 450 pounds, had a stomach surgery, lost it, but then gained it all back. And me personally, I struggle with you know, food on a daily basis, um, mostly because my favorite meal is a dozen donuts and some privacy. <laughs> um, but for me, it wasn't about, um, you know, my issues with food, you know, aren't about money and it isn't about access, it's about emotional stuff and numbing and that feeling that comes at the end of the day when you just want to sit on your couch and sort of veg out. And the idea that there was kids living 10 miles from me that were, you know, the most stressed, you know, the most harried, and that there was no healthy food for them even if they wanted it, seemed too much. Um, so I actually wrote Father Boyle an email and said, I'm gonna speed this up a little bit, but said, look, I have an idea for a, for a nonprofit that will help these families. And he invited me down to Homeboy Industries. And I remember sitting there and watching, you know, I was, he was standing, um, or he was, he has, a, it's, it actually sort of looks like a hedge fund office. It's this beautiful, gleaming building, but instead of, you know, traders, there's, you know, gang members with face, with face tattoos, you know, that say, fuck the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's a little more intimidating than a hedge fund office. Um, so, but I remember sitting, and there's, there's basically rows like this out in front of his office, and it's full of people waiting to talk to him. And so I, I remember sitting there waiting in line, and uh, he came out of his office, and he was, you know, said goodbye to the gang member that he was talking to, and all of a sudden these two sort of wealthy folks, or they looked wealthy, you know, the sort of suits and white, you know, um, <laughs> they, they approached him and sort of engaged him in conversation. And as he was talking to them, I saw this little young guy walking by, um, maybe 12 or 13 years old. Like, you know, when you think about like a gang member, you don't think of a 12-year-old, but he was this like kid who had tattoos, but he was walking by Father Boyle and you could tell that he wanted to talk to Father Boyle, but he was nervous about those men. And I watched as Father Boyle was talking to these men and saw that and literally stepped out of his conversation and reached back and grabbed the kid and pulled him into a hug. Mm -hmm. And had those men wait while he talked to that kid for a good five minutes. And I felt like, you know, again, just that, that here was a guy that was living the kind of life that I wanted to live. Um, how, how much time do I, do I have, by the way? So, um, I'll just tell you one quick story and then about this new business that we're starting. So, um, 
I, I started, we, we spent about a year creating a program called Grocery Ships that um, it is, a, is a group program, so 10 parents living in a food desert join a group that meets once a week for two hours. And in those, week, in those meetings, there's nutrition education and healthy cooking skills and fresh produce. Um, but the groups are structured not like a didactic lecture, but as support groups. So a box of Kleenex sits in the middle of the circle that everyone sits in, and there's a lot of time devoted to speaking about emotional issues and family issues and addiction issues and all those other things that go into eating that are often unaddressed in sort of a nonprofit world. And I remember, you know, sort of what a crazy idea that was and how nerve-wracking it was for me to go in and start meeting folks in South Los Angeles, which was a, you know, South Los Angeles per capita income is $13,000 a year and life expectancy is 10 years lower than Pacific Palisades, for example. And, it, you know, when I thought about the sort of structure of the city, you know, you see a map of Los Angeles, but for a lot of people, me included, before this, if you really look at what the map looked like, it would be sort of like north of the 10, west of the 405, but there's this entire hole down below the 10 that is actually the most densely populated part of the city that many of us have never gone to. Um, and so I was in there, you know, talking with these moms in South LA and also talking to them about this idea of you know, sitting in a group and talking about your emotions, and I was a, you know, white male former hedge fund trader. Um, <laughs> and I remember the first group meetings, it was literally like me and seven moms in this church bungalow parking lot, a bungalow in a church parking lot, and the meetings, group ships meetings, start with what's called a check-in, where you basically answer the question, how are you feeling? And I remember the first meeting, People didn't really participate. They said their names, but they said pass, basically, or they said a one-word answer. And this was sort of the moment where you were open to talk about whatever emotional stuff was going on in your life. And that happened the first meeting, and we had to end the first meeting early because nobody participated. And the second meeting went the same way. And then the third meeting started the same way until I got to a woman named Helen. And Helen oh, was this retired school teacher who, uh, when I met her, she said, you know, I have five kids living in my house, but none of them are mine. They're all the children of my brothers and sisters who are drug addicts living on the street. And I've taken in these kids, um, and these kids only get to see their parents um, but twice a year on Thanksgiving and Christmas. Their parents are allowed into the house, and they take a shower, and then they have dinner with their kids, and then they have to go. And she said that the reason she wanted to join this program is because every time the parents left, the kids would turn to her and say, Helen, am I gonna, am I gonna end up like my parents? And she would say, no, you're gonna end up like me. But she had seen those kids start to get, you know, struggle with food, struggle with health. And so anyways, we were sitting in that circle and she said, you know, it finally got to her and she stopped, and she looked at me, and she said, you know, it's been 20 years since anyone asked how I was feeling. And a tear rolled down her cheek, and she opened up about what her life was really like, and the woman after her opened up about what her life was like, and that was the beginning of something really special by the end of that six months, you know, the data was really great. Like, you know, the increase in fruit and vegetable consumption, decrease in fast food, all the sort of decrease in BMI, um, all the stuff that you'd want. But the bigger part was that that collection of strangers had become a group that was supporting each other on this difficult journey together. And that's what Grocery Ships is about. Grocery Ships is the nonprofit that I still run. Um, this year we'll do 30 groups, so it'll be 300 parents. Um, and am I out of time, basically? Okay, then I'm gonna close with um, just what I'm doing now. So about two years ago, um, this, this young private equity guy had come to a Grocery Ships graduation and was really inspired by what we were doing, so started volunteering and then ended up coming to work for grocery ships full time, making about $30,000 a year. And 
you know, he and I were sort of sitting in our office in South Los Angeles listening to a lot of our parents say, you know, look, I'm a single mom, I've got four kids and two jobs, um, so this produce and cooking is great, and I've got to eat food on the go, and in this neighborhood, that means McDonald's. And so David and I basically started thinking about a business that could bring healthy food into this neighborhood at prices lower than McDonald's. And what we came up with is this concept called Every Table, where a central commissary kitchen uh, creates a large amount of healthy, delicious meals and then packages them in grab-and-go containers. And that's really the key economic insight. It sounds really simple, but you know, if you think about what a Chipotle is like, you, know, you walk into a Chipotle, it's 2,500 square feet of space, 10 to 15 employees, a fully built-out commercial kitchen, which is all why Chipotle will never sell a $4 burrito. Um, but these, if you package the food in grab-and-go containers, then you can open up small storefronts, uh, 500 to 750 square feet. And instead of kitchens, you have refrigerated display cases, sort of like Starbucks, and you only need two employees. Um, and so for us, what we figured out is that, you know, basically our all-in cost for the commissary, the ingredient cost, the packaging, and the labor and overhead at the, at the grab-and-go storefronts would work out if we assume 500 meals a day, which is our target, that would work out to about $3.50 per meal on cost. So we could have basically said, hey, we're gonna you know, now sell food for five bucks and that's a great business and it's the cheapest healthy food out there, it's gonna be great. Um, but I was thinking a lot about these moms in South Los Angeles who you know, we often see applications for grocery ships that say $1,200 a month, monthly income and $750 on rent and you know, four kids, and for that mom, she's having trouble making it through the month every month. And there is a huge difference to her between a meal that costs $3.50 and one that costs $5.50. Whereas in this neighborhood and the neighborhood where I live, we're all used to paying $14 at Tender Greens and $12 at Sweet Green and $9 for a green juice. Um, so we implemented something called a variable pricing strategy where we base the price of the meals according to the neighborhoods that the stores are located in. So our first store is in South LA where the food will be sold and sold for $4. Um, is being sold for $4 that we actually opened last week. Um, <laughs> And then our next store opens in downtown LA um, where we'll be selling the same meals for $8. And I'm not to, I'm, I'm, I'll cut off in one minute, but you know, we, we hired the former head chef of the Cirque in New York, um, one of the greatest restaurants in the world. Um, and we built our menu with the parents in South Los Angeles that we are trying to serve. And so we have this incredibly delicious, eclectic menu that celebrates the cultures and cuisines of Los Angeles with incredible healthy meals, but also incredibly delicious ones. Um, so come check us out in South Los Angeles. Um, come check us out in downtown. We hope to be in Pasadena soon. And I've written a book called For the Love of Money um, that's a lot about my experiences in this process and coming to grapple with this idea of what success really means and how that idea has changed over time. So thank you very much. Really appreciate being here. Amazing presentation. It sounds like you've lived a really interesting and fruitful life. Um, and I think you're just doing really great work in, in a more philanthropic sense and serving the, the underserved communities and whatnot. We wish you the best of luck uh, in that endeavor. Um, and also, just so you guys know, this is, this is Romans here. So if you want to check out the book, I highly recommend buying it here because you're actually supporting our local businesses. So we really appreciate that. Uh, we're going to open up to Q&A right now. So if you have a question, raise your hand. John will walk around with the mic. Uh, save comments for offline. Sam, will you stick around for a little bit to sure. continue the story or, or share ideas with other people? Great. So comments later, questions now. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. You know, I thought you lived from Maryland. I saw you in the news this past week, right? Yeah. <laughs> Hi there, I'm Sandra. Thank you for coming and sharing your inspiring story. Um, I wanted to ask you, what are your key performance indicators that you set for both your nonprofit and you're in a for-profit aspect too, the grocery ships, right? Yeah. And then the nonprofit. So if you can talk about like what your yeah, key metrics are that help you keep on track for your goals, um, and 
I guess two part question. Um, also, how you combine that nonprofit, heart driven mission with what you're trying to do on the co corporate or commercial or um, profit driven side? Because I think that's the, one of the hardest questions. Um, thank you. Sure. Um, so real quick, so KPIs for every table is like, you know, labor cost per meal, um, ingredient cost, um, daily volume of meals, um, spoilage is a big one. So if you think about our business, it's about, you know, we have a truck, you know, we make the food in the morning and deliver it to the store in one bulk volume. And so a lot of our issues is, you know, can we sort of project volume of sales enough so everything is fresh sold the day it's made so that we can you know have enough so that we don't stock out but also keep spoiler trace low um, for grocery ships it's you know i can talk about the metrics but one of the things i've come to understand is like grocery ships is all about trying to keep this thing afloat like nonprofit fundraising is hard i mean you know grocery ships um budget is about two hundred fifty thousand dollars per year and it is a struggle every year to raise that with every table, we raised you know three million dollars in a matter of months. You know a ton from people that had to, you know were donate graciously to grocery ships with a five thousand dollar check and put a hundred thousand dollars into every table. You know, so it's it's just a whole different world, and that's sort of part of why I started every table or we started every table was to to leverage that power of capitalism to create something scalable and sustainable. Um, and then as to mission, you know, we incorporated as a public benefit corporation, um, so that that's part of it. But really, you know, the thing that I love about, and, and the hard thing about social entrepreneurship, I think, is that you know, in the old world, it was sort of like very clearly delineated: nonprofits are for heart, and for profits are for head, and for ambition. And now, social enterprise, you know. It, it theoretically combines those two, but what it really does is it forces that decision onto you, you know, and so that, and I've sort of come to believe about myself and, and everybody basically that we all have inside us these two parts of us, like we have these ambitions for the things that we want for ourselves, the wealth, the money, the power, and that stuff is really important. Um, we also have this part inside of us that is you know, our aspiration, what we want to contribute to the world, how we want to connect with people, how we want to lift people up that haven't had as much opportunity. And that is an equally valid, equally powerful part. Um, and here, before this, that though the ability to sort of execute on both of those within the same career haven't existed um, as sort of clearly as they do now, which I love, and that, that's why I sort of every table is for me sort of the most fulfilling work that I've ever done. Um, but at the same time, it really does, you know, force me to, you know, we're always going to be asked by investors, well, you know, your store in South LA works at a 10% EBITDA margin, and your store in West LA works at a 47% margin, so let's open more West LA stores. <laughs> And, and so I'm happy that it resides in me, and I, and I do think that my experience on Wall Street and nonprofits sort of gives me, you know, an understanding of those two sides of myself, and I hope the nonprofit side continues to lead. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Aaron Fike. Um, do you ever, did you ever have a credibility gap problem? Oh, you know, white guy. Oh, yeah. Turned down a three point six million dollar bonus or half of it, moved up to tell them what to do. Um, yeah. How did you uh, overcome that? Yeah, and by the way, I do never tell them what to do. The perception. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think that's a great question, and absolutely, and you know, the two sort of responses to that is how I addressed that internally was two ways. One was, you know, attempting with as much as I could to in every single interaction in South Los Angeles operate with extreme humility and extreme respect and not tell people what to do and not give advice and ask questions and, and all those things. And even despite that, I am very aware that I carry in the color of my skin and my educational background a deep history of oppression and violation and violence and that's just true. 
And so I believe that it is on me every, you know, I worked in South LA for three years and we have a, a ton of great contacts and a very deep network and I still know that there is a deep amount of suspicion for me that may never go away just because that's the history of our country. And so it's something that I deal with. Next question. Good morning, my name is Julie. I wanted to find out if you have reached out to the um, LA LA County, Orange County, Riverside, and San Bernardino school district to try to um, sell your costs. Yeah, we, we've just basically made the decision not to not to do that um, for a lot of reasons. Um, I, you know, one of the hard thing margins are low, and it's it's a tougher business basically. Um, so maybe in the future, and I would love to do that, but right now it's all about these grab and go store rooms. Back here, Sam. Sophia Chan, I have a question regarding what you're doing now with the restaurant and the nonprofit, and it is a challenge to raise funds for nonprofit. Have you thought of, from your for profit, create a foundation? Because actual investors are happy to make money, and a percentage of that go into good costs. So, have you thought about foundation? Yeah, I mean, so. I want to think about how to answer that question. Like, yes, I think that's going to be a possibility for us, um, and we'll think about it down the road. I do think that, like, one of the problems I sort of see in the world, you know, with my judgmental hat on, is basically that, you know, you set up these corporations that may or may not be doing something productive or good with what they're doing, and then they have this, you know, social benefit arm that gives a little bit away. And sort of like the problem with foundations in general where you have $100 million invested in Raytheon and, you know, Kraft and Coca-Cola, and then you have, you're spending 5% to bring peace and, you know, nutrition to the, to the world. It's like, you know, you're trying to fix with a very weak left hand the problems that those very strong right hand has created. So all that is to say that one of the things I love about every table is it's like, the execution of the business is the is the sort of nonprofit, meaning that if our sort of success is basically volume of meals sold, and if we sell a hundred thousand meals in a year, that's a hundred thousand meals that people didn't eat McDonald's or didn't eat something else, and a mom had her time saved and didn't have to go to the store and cook and clean up afterwards, and that it's in there. Um, so what we do with the profits, I mean, I'm sure whether it's money that I make, that I donate, or whether the company donates, will sort of yet to be seen. Over here. I have a question, light on the part. Um, one of the concerns I have is the food back to the children in the schools. Um, have you thought of maybe, and maybe that's uh, even the start, is how you teach children to eat healthy. Have you thought about your educational program to go into schools and maybe expand it? Uh, yes, and I, I think that work is really important, um, and we're sort of expanding in that direction. And I ultimately believe that, like, you know, when it comes to food right now, the person that has the power in that selection in a household is the parent. Um, and so for us, it's about working with the parents to impact the whole family. There's a lot of sort of anecdotal stories about a kid coming home and saying, Mom, I, you know, I grew kale in a garden, and and, and I think we should eat kale tonight. And the mom says, great, and the nonprofit is very happy and sends out all this information about that. But then the next day, it's hard for the mom to know what to do with the kale, and you know, she's gonna go back to her routines. And so for us, it's about changing those routines, and I think the education of the kids is also really important. Up right here. Hi, so when you, let's say that your business continue to be successful and you expand to new territory, how are you going to get the underserved community to start going to your location at every table instead of McDonald's? I mean, price is great, but wouldn't the community want a grocery store at the end of the day, preferably, when, you're, when you live in the food desert? Um, okay, that's a multifaceted question and a really good one. Um, so a lot of people think that when I when I say it's a healthy food business that we're bringing in sort of dry kale salads and you know a limp sort of whole wheat wrap and then we're convincing people through education that they need to eat this. 
<laughs> we decided to do it differently and to basically, like, that's why we hired literally one of the best chefs in the country and worked extensively with the sort of families we were trying to serve to create these, like, we don't even say they're healthy in the store. These are like Jamaican jerk chicken with coconut beans and rice and plantains and kale and carrots and a chicken tinga with chayote peppers and black beans and grains and you know, blackened fish with sweet potatoes and, um, I forgot the other things, but, but, <laughs> but these are like spectacular meals that are cheaper than what we, we can afford. They're much higher volume, heavier, more filling. Um, and for me, I think this sort of evolution of the grab and go is sort of this natural evolution from, you know, you ask about grocery stores, so I'm gonna just wax on that for a second. So people think food deserts, they think, okay, put a grocery store in it. Well. A grocery store is a very capital intensive, low margin business in a good neighborhood. In a lower income neighborhood, those margins get squeezed to almost negative. And then what you have, let's say you even make that work, which is very difficult financially, then you have a grocery store in the middle of the neighborhood. And look, I don't know what your opinion on this is, but like, you know, it's not as if in a food desert, health is terrible, and then everywhere else in America, health is great. We're, we're on pace for a 50% obesity rate in this country, and a lot of it is because in grocery stores you have this nice sort of perimeter of produce and meat or whatever it is, and in the middle is this terrible stuff that brings you diabetes and makes you sick. So also some of the demographic sort of trends that are happening is massive decline, massive demand for healthy food massive decline in meals eaten at home and time that people spend in the kitchen and massive increase in the percentage of time that people want to eat out, which is like, like I'm sure all of us, like, you know, women went into the workforce, thank the good Lord, you know, 40 years ago, but cooking rates have declined because of that. And there's no home ec taught in schools and most kids grow up not knowing how to cook. And so that's why actually right now there's this, the widest spread of all time between the ingredients and the cost to buy at a restaurant because there's so much demand for it and so little supply. So one of the things I like about our solution is it's this capital light, operationally simple uh, model that is low cost, is more convenient, and I think the food is better than anything else out there. Can I tackle one last question? Hi, yeah, you, you mentioned early on that your truck goes from your kitchen to your store, soon to be stores. Um, and what I've noticed in the, um, you know, like in north, northwest Pasadena and stuff, is I actually see trucks that stop, open up, and they sell produce out the back. Um, and have you thought of reaching more people by being mobile rather than having fixed locations? And also, do you see yourself in competition maybe driving these guys out of business? The guys who do supply the area with the mobile food. Yeah, so it's a good, it's a really good question about the mobile markets, and I'll tell you my candid opinion on them is that that's sort of like grocery stores, which is like people's sort of first reaction of what you should do. But the basically the costs of food distribution are twofold. They're the cost of the overhead of the space, so you do save a little bit of that on the on the truck. But then there's also the cost of the labor. And labor is actually the bigger part of it. And you don't save anything on labor by having a mobile market. And, and you lose a tremendous amount. You know, it, the, the beautiful thing about having bricks and mortar, and especially a small footprint bricks and mortar, and especially a small footprint bricks and mortar in South LA and Inglewood, which costs almost next to nothing, is that you can really become part of the community and people can build their routines around it and you can do large volume from there Whereas the mobile market's like, you know, you save a little bit of you know, money on the overhead, but then people don't know where to find it, you don't know how to depend on it, and you're still paying all that money in labor, and you've got to park it somewhere at night, which also costs money too.